Hallelujah. So listen, the title of my message this morning is Peace (laughs) or a Sword. Peace or a Sword. Amen. You know, the more the more that I live the Christian life by His grace, and the more that I desire to live uh, out loud or in this world that we live in, and and by His grace be a representative of the Lord, the more I realize that really the name of Jesus does it brings a separation line. You, you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot of people, and I've been saying this for quite a while, and the Lord really impressed it on my heart about a year ago that there's a lot of people that really do genuinely love God. Amen. I I believe with all of my heart that y'all definitely would not have shown up here this morning if you didn't love God, or if you weren't at least looking, Amen, to see or to understand more about God. That's what causes people to even come to church. And there's just a lot of people, if you start talking to people out there in the world that you're living in, you're going to realize there's a lot of people that are thinking a lot about God. You know, I'm not going to go off on long stories, but just yesterday I worked a shift, and it's just funny because, like, one of the, there happened to be a student that was going to work with me, and one of the first things she said was, I heard you're a preacher and you know what's it what so of course she was like an hour and a half later she was kind of like wow I really asked that question didn't I because I I said hey look I'm sorry if because there was some differences we didn't agree on and and, you know and I said well hopefully she said no you don't have to apologize to me buddy because I brought it up (laughs) amen and and then yesterday another nurse that I had been knowing for a while she said I heard you're a preacher and it, it just opened up an opportunity you know to minister Christ but you know one of the thing the main point that I'm trying to make is is that the more that I live my life out loud for for the Lord, I realize that there's a lot of people that love God, but still not a lot of people according to the word that are serving the Lord. Is it okay if I say that? Is it okay if I just speak truth to you this morning by the grace of God? If if it comes if it comes across that I'm that I'm being, you know, angry, I'm not mad at anybody in this place. Amen. If I ever come across as though I'm looking angry, it's it's because I'm mad at the devil and I'm mad at the lies, that deception that try to pull people away from the Lord. So I just want you to give give you that little, uh, that little caveat there before we get started. I don't even know that I'll look mad, but I'm just saying, hey, look, you got a word, uh, the title of a message right here that says, Peace or Sword. So there's a good chance that I'll start stepping on some toes before it's over with and probably my own before I step on yours. Amen? Praise God. Well, hey, look, the first thing that I want you to see, we're about to read this passage of Scripture out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 119, verses 1 through 19. And there's a specific passage in here that I kind of want to look at at some point in time. You know, one of the things about the Bible that I really love, as I've understood more about the Bible, is that sometimes I run across things that I don't really know if I understand it that well. You know what I'm saying? And the tendency, as all of us as believers, I just want you to know, you've done it. I want you to know that I've done it before, so I don't want you to feel weird about it. The tendency is that when we read something that we don't understand, it's just to kind of like try to, you know, just keep moving and not try to figure it out. So there's a passage in this particular uh, story that that I'm going to kind of like focus in on and in some way use the main idea of what I'm trying to talk about. And it might be a passage that you've read before and you didn't really understand it. But what I want you to know is, is that when we read Verses 1 through 19 right here. The context is that John the Baptist, he's in prison. All right. Y'all remember the story of John the Baptist, right? The Bible says that John, in the year that Caiaphas and Annas were high priests, it was kind of like a very strange thing that there would be two high priests in the same year. The Bible says in the year that Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the Spirit of God came to John the Baptist. Isn't that interesting? That you know, see, John was of the lineage of the Levitical priesthood, and so, but so he was a he was a legitimate priest for Israel, or he was born within that family. His father, Zacharias, and both his mom were, were from the, uh, the tribe of Levi. And so that just means that he was of the priestly uh, tribe. And, and so, but yet at the same time, the Holy Spirit bypassed the high priests that were in existence, bypassed them, and came to John the Baptist. And the Bible says that John the Baptist came into the wilderness, and he was dressed in camel's hair, and he, and, and he would eat in a, in a leather belt, and that he would eat locusts, and he would eat wild honey and he came out there and he was a radical and he came out preaching in the wilderness repent 
for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, and he was preparing the way as a messenger for the Lord. Y'all remember that story. He would, he would preach this message of repentance, and he would baptize people with a message of repentance that was showing that they were, what, what does the word repent mean? To realize that they had moved away from God and that they were sorrowful for moving away from God, and they wanted to get close to God. And so John the Baptist's ministry was, was you know, preparing the way for Jesus to come. Amen. And so he's out there preaching in the wilderness. And see, what happened was is that crowds of people came to see John the Baptist, this radical guy that's out in the wilderness. So they're not going right now to the better as one day in your courts. So they're not going to the court of the, of the temple right now. They're not going. No, he's in the wilderness and the crowds are flocking to him. Because let me tell you something. False religion leaves people empty and dry. I need you to understand that this morning. Religion, it paints itself, uh, you know, it puts lipstick on itself. It, it makes itself try to look pretty, and it, and, and it seems like it's right because all the lingo is there and the language is there, and even the name Jesus is there, but religion leaves people empty. We're talking about a true relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I need you to understand that this morning, that the whole purpose of the, like, if this story is real, I told that to at least five people yesterday, if this story is real, then we should be paying a whole lot more attention to it. I mean, if the story of God is real, and there's a real God, and he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, and there's a real devil out there causing deception, we should really start paying attention a lot more attention, amen, and how this is affecting our life, amen. And so John the Baptist, he was a radical, and the people were tired of dead religion that was leaving them empty, and so they went out there to see this anomaly that showed up in the wilderness that was preaching this message. And if you'll remember in John chapter 1, John the Baptist, whenever he shows up and he's preaching this message, and then Jesus, Jesus is there, and you see the Holy Spirit through the Father, the Father had revealed to John the Baptist that Jesus Jesus was the one. Now, now, real quick for a Sunday school lesson, most of y'all in this church might already know this, but if you don't, then you at least get to learn one thing this morning, amen, that, that whenever, when it says that he was the one, and, and whenever Simon Peter's brother Andrew went and found Peter, we found him. Well, what are you talking about we found? We found the one that we've been waiting for. What, 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 do you, what does that mean? See, the nation of Israel had been in existence for thousands of years since the time of Abraham. It had grown into a great nation. They had the temple. They had the tabernacle before that. They had the law. They had the word of God. They had the priests. And they existed within this nation called, this empire called Rome. And the church, Jesus shows up in the midst of that situation into the nation of Israel. But by the time Jesus shows up, religion, dead dry religion had taken over and it was preventing people from being able to see God. But all those thousands of years, the Old Testament had told the people of Israel that he was coming. Who's he? The Christ. The anointed one, he's coming. He will show up and would give us clues of what he would look like. And then guess what? When John the Baptist saw him that second day at the Jordan River, he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he goes on later and he says, I would not have even known that that's who he was had the voice from heaven that commissioned me to baptize for him would not have told me. And so now I'm here to tell you, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there he is. We found him, the one. Amen. I, I, that, that's just so powerful to me. I don't know what that does for you. May, but look, hang around a little while, and maybe next year it will really hit your heart. You know, that's just so powerful to me that the word of God is written. And look, if you haven't felt it yet this morning or if you felt a little something, I just want you to know there's more. There's always more of God. You can experience God. I want you to know that. You can feel the presence of God. And the presence of God wants to come into your heart and your life. And he wants to minister to you. And he wants to change you. And he wants to heal you. Amen? Whatever you've gone through in life, I want you to know God cares. And he, and he wants to heal you. So 
Now, though, John the Baptist has done all of this. You know, he's like, I come preaching the message. I'm preparing the way. God has called me to do this and to be a voice in the wilderness, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John the Baptist did what the Lord, look, man, people thought he was weird. I mean, did, would you not think that this dude's weird? I, like, I mean, we're going like, to, let's just go out into, let's just go see, man. This is, I heard there's a festival out in the wilderness, you know. I mean, you see it, right? I mean, I can't, I'm not trying to be weird, but when I was 18, I went to see Ozzy Osbourne in Baton Rouge at the state fairgrounds. I mean, the, the place was packed out. I mean, everybody's going to go see Ozzy. I mean, what, that was pretty goofy, right? He had just bit a bad head, bad head off and had to get rabies shots. But anyway, we went out there to see that craziness. Right, And so the people don't know what they're really expecting to see because they're used to dead, dry religion. And they're like, hey, they got a guy out there in the wilderness. And and look, so the the crowds flock out there to go see John the Baptist. And he's preaching a message that's penetrating people's hearts and is preparing the way for Jesus. Amen. But look, now in this story, the context, John the Baptist is in prison. I can assure you that when John the Baptist was out there full of the zeal of the Holy Spirit, that he did not think that he was going to end up in prison by doing the will of God. Amen? I mean, he might have had like a little inkling every now and then, but he didn't know how it was going to end up. And so while in prison, John asks, is Jesus the one or should we look for another? So let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 11, um, verses Matthew 11, verses 1 through 19. All right? So when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples. So John the Baptist had his own disciples, learners, right? And said to him, so he sends his disciples to say to Jesus, Are you the one? Well, what are you talking about, John? You just, the voice from heaven told you that he was the one. But now I'm in prison. I just got to know. I just need you to verify for me. Are you the one or the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. I just want to like, this isn't part of my message, but I want to take just a second and I want to mention some things that are written in here. Number one, I don't know about you, but I want to be a man of God that believes God for the impossible. God, the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. If he healed yesterday, he'll heal today. I need you to know that. If he set free yesterday, he'll set you free today. If he filled with the Holy Spirit yesterday, he'll fill with the Holy Spirit today. If he's looking for a people of right, that, that, that want to live a righteous life and want to give their life to them yesterday, he still wants a people today. Amen. And so I think as a church, we should be praying together. Lord, we want to see the supernatural. We want to see people delivered. We want to see people set free. Amen. Lord, if you died on the cross to give us victory over the power of sin and over the works of darkness, we want to see people walking in that liberty. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And we want to see blind people, blind eyes open. We want to be able to see people that can't walk, walk. We want to be able to see lepers cleansed and deaf ears be able to hear. I'm talking about physically, amen? Like I, <laughs> Before I get into the spiritual aspect of it, I want you to know that God is a healing God this morning. That's the kind of church that I got saved in. We believe that God heals people. We believe God fills them up with his Holy Spirit. We believe God delivers people and sets them on fire. We believe God makes people witnesses for the kingdom of God. Amen. And in the physical truth of all of that, I need you to know that there's also a spiritual message here that people are blind and they can't see the kingdom of God. People are walking around. Oh, they hear that God is real. They hear the name of Jesus, but they're blind. Nicodemus was told by Jesus in John chapter 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
The, the kingdom of God is here on this earth. What are you talking about? It came in the form of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus said, it's expedient or a good thing that I go away. For if I do not go, he will not come. What was he talking about? He said, once I'm ascended to the Father, the Holy Spirit's going to descend from heaven. And then we also learn from the Bible that, that when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached and you or I believe by faith, that Jesus is the one that the Father sent, that he died for us on the cross, and, and that he resurrected on the third day. When you believe that from your heart, amen, then a miracle happens, and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the, in, on the inside of your heart. And then now you become that person Jesus was talking about, that, that, that unless a man or a woman is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, nor can he enter into the kingdom of God. You must be born again, my friend. This is not an option. And, and that's one of the conversations I had with the young lady yesterday or the day before. I worked with her for two days. There's a difference between what the most religion around here calls being born again. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it because it is what it is. The Catholic religion says that you're born again in baptismal waters as an infant. That is not what the word of God says. That is not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that a man is born again when he believes from his heart and confesses with his mouth that Jesus Christ, hallelujah, died for your sins and resurrected from the dead. And when you pray, Lord, come into my heart, forgive me of my sins. I believe you are the one. Lord, forgive me. Hallelujah. When you pray that from your heart, hallelujah. you got to believe it in your head first. Somebody had to have told you something, even if it was something as simple as call on his name, Jesus. Even if you just whispered the name of Jesus, but the Lord knew what you meant in your heart, that you were looking for the truth, and you cried out, and you said, he's got to be the truth, and you, cry, you call on the name of Jesus, and he comes to live on the inside. You will never be the same. I got to tell you that that is the message, and you'll never be able to see him until that happens, because the Bible says the natural mind in, in, in Corinthians, in the letter to the Corinthians, the natural mind cannot perceive or see the things of God. The natural mind, separate from the Holy Spirit, cannot understand the things of God. Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, you cannot see, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said, how can a man climb a second time into his mother's womb? No. What's born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit. Is spirit. So spiritually speaking, we want blind, we want blind people to be able to see the kingdom, right? We want them, we want the lame to walk. I, I, I love there's a scripture in Hebrews, I don't remember where it is, but it talked about how God will straighten out lame feet. <laughs> I think about that. And I'm not trying to look at man, if if your foot one of your feet kind of deviates out, I'm not making fun of nobody. I'm just trying to make a point. Like, you know, you see sometimes people got one of their feet like might be lame. And I just imagine that if you're walking like that, then what could happen is, is that you get off course. Or you can't walk right. If your foot is lame, you can't walk right. Guess what? The whole of the word of God about people serving God is described as people walking. The walk is the journey, right? The journey of life. And look, if your foot is lame, you can't really walk spiritually for the Lord. God wants to heal our lame feet spiritually so that we can walk for him. Lepers are a sign of sinfulness and uncleanness. God wants to cleanse us spiritually so that we no longer have to be spiritual lepers. Deafened ears. Listen, you and I need, you and I both need the help of the Holy Spirit for our spiritual ears to be able to hear and to understand the word of God. He says the dead are raised up. Man, wouldn't you like to see somebody that was physically dead raised from the dead? Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be amazing. <laughs> I always tell this story, though, when I think of that. <clears throat> because, look, if God wants to raise a person from the physical dead, I'm all with it. I know Sister Tut. Look, I, look, I need to be around more people of faith, bro. Sister Tut, man, when she used to do them funerals, <laughs> she'd say, look, one last time before we close this casket, Lord, if you want to raise them, you can raise them. But they got embalming fluid. It don't matter. God knows where every piece and particle of that human being is. And one time she said it. She'd always, and she, look, she wasn't scared, dude. Every funeral, she said out loud to everybody, you know, we're going to believe God. And, and look, one time she said, I thought one of them was coming up. She said, I, I thought. 
thought I could see a little perspiration on his lip, and I just knew he was coming up out of that coffin. But, you know, there is a story, and there's other stories besides this one, but Smith Wigglesworth, I remember reading his book. I'm making a point here. Because a lot of times we want to see signs and wonders. And I want to see signs and wonders. I'm good with that. But I don't want to seek after a sign and a wonder. Because Jesus said a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. He said, and the only sign that you're going to get is the sign of the prophet Jonah who was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. What is he talking about? I'm going to give you a sign, all right. And you're going to put me on a cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried in the tomb for three days. And I'm going to come busting out of the grave. That's the sign that this wicked and an adulterous generation is going to get because that's what you need. That's what we need. We needed Jesus to die for our sin. But anyway, Smith Wigglesworth, I guess in the early 1900s, man, he was a man of faith. Crazy stories, right? Do you hear? I don't even know. I wasn't planning on talking about him, but crazy stories. They say that one time there was a woman. He was just walking down the road. I don't even know what you think about this. I don't know what I think about it theologically. I'm just telling you what the man did <clears throat> according to what they said. Some woman was walking down the road and had a big cancer on her face, and supposedly he rebuked it and slapped it, and the thing fell off onto the ground. I don't know. It seems extreme to me because I've heard of other stories of people like in that Toronto revival that dude Todd Bentley was kicking people and stuff, and that wasn't of the Lord. But I do know that when you read the writings of Smith Wigglesworth, his heart for the Lord, I can remember there was another story part in the story that was, that was so good, and it kind of touches my heart every time I hear it. They were riding in some type of transportation, going from one town to another, and he was in the midst of like three other men, and they were all men of God, and he was going to do a preaching engagement, and he made, they were all talking, and he said, stop. He, and I don't remember what the time frame was, but I'm pretty sure it was something like five minutes. We have been holding a conversation for five minutes in the name of our Lord Jesus has not been mentioned one time. Let us, and, and he wanted to repent. He, he said, let that never happen to us again. Amen. I know that seems extreme, but you see the, the heart, amen, that he had. Anyway, I was saying all that to say this, that his wife died in the bedroom. And the story goes that he prayed over her and she was raised from the dead. He lifted up her limp body, and he put her up against the wall, and he said, Light, God, breathe life into her. And she woke up, and she took a breath, and according to what the story says, she told him, Smith, what are you doing? He's like, well, what are you talking about, honey? She's like, I was going into the presence of the Lord. Let me go, Smith. Let me go. And hallelujah, she went on to be with the Lord according to the story. Why did I even say that? Whether you believe it or not, that's up to you. That's between you and Jesus. I, look, do I question whether God can raise the dead? He raised Jesus. Amen. He, if he wants to raise the dead, he'll raise the dead right here, right now. Amen. I believe that. But I just find it interesting to see that sometimes we over here, Lord, Lord, raise the physical dead. Let me see the physical dead. Well, what about the spiritual dead? Because really the only reason to raise the physical dead, come on somebody, work with me, because if I ain't telling you the truth, I want you to come find me after church. Or you can raise your hand and we'll stop church and we'll deal with it now. But if I'm, if, so if I'm wrong, let me know. But if I'm right, what is the reason to raise the physical dead? Only if they didn't know the Lord, right? If they didn't know the Lord, Lord, raise them up so that we can tell them about you, so that they can receive you, so that when they die, they can go into eternity and be with you instead of slip into a devil's hell. That's the only reason I can see, because if they're a believer, hallelujah, the dirge, purposeful word choice, the dirge or the mourning of the funeral shouldn't really be mourning anymore. It ought to turn into a Holy Ghost party. It ought to turn. Hey, I understand we're going to miss them. We're going to miss their presence, their personality, the love that we had towards them. But if they are a believer, hallelujah, they done went home to be with the Lord, and they're in a better place. Do we believe that this morning? I hope you do, because if you don't, really and truly, what are we doing, right? I mean, if, if there is eternal life in Christ, praise God. We got something to hope for because I got to tell you, better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house than thousands elsewhere. Amen. So you go tell, you, he wants to know. Jesus tells him, hey, you go back and you tell John this is what's happening. 
The blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the lame are walking, the lepers are being cleansed. Hallelujah. The dead are receiving life and the poor are having the truth preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. And this is where it gets a little bit interesting. And I love scriptures that I don't completely understand and that i got to dig around for. And we're going to break them down before it's over. But what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? I, I didn't break this down later on, so let me break it down a little bit. You know, a reed is very flimsy and very easily moves in the direction of whichever way the wind blows. Right? There's a scripture that says in Ephesians that, that, that people are tossed like a boat on a wave because of false doctrine, false teachings that are not true. So it causes a person to be like a boat. One time I was on a boat. I probably told you that story before, and the rudder broke. We were on our way to a, a platform offshore, and we floated for 16 hours until they could send the diver out there to put another prop on there. Now, I, I would, okay, but anyway, let's not go on to that. The point is, is this, is that sometimes people's lives as believers or unbelievers especially are like boats without a rudder because the waves, all the different teachings and the different things that the world is saying out there, there's so many voices and so much chatter that's coming at us from different directions that people find themselves like a reed swaying with every way the wind changes and blows. And that's what Jesus is saying. John wants to know if I'm the one. You go back and you tell John what's happening. But let me ask you a question, all you that are around here. What did you go out into the wilderness to see when you went to go see John? Did you expect to see a reed shaken by the wind? Now, based on the story, it would seem like Jesus was saying that John was being, that John was being wavered. But Jesus goes on to say, again, he says, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Okay, another, the King James has soft raiment. Okay, what does he mean? Like silk material, okay? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What he's saying is, is that, listen, you know, in humanity, even back then and still today, people are drawn towards people that dress fashionable. Oh, look at that outfit. That is so cute. Look at those shoes. Oh, my gosh. They got their toenails painted just right, and everything's matching just right. And look at the car they drive. And look at the house they live in. Oh, look, they got it sewed together, right? It just looks so. I'm going to listen to this person because, look, they got it all together right here. Their house is just absolutely beautiful. Look at those kids, how cute. Look, they even highlighted their little eyes in blue on the portrait of the family on the wall. It just looks so good. Everything looks so good. Look, that ain't got nothing to do with the Lord. That ain't got nothing to do with the Lord. That is the world's perception of what looks good and what looks normal, okay, to mankind. And man is drawn to that. And Jesus is saying, what did you expect you was going to go see when you went to see this prophet? A man dressed in silken clothes? No. That's the kind of people that live in king's houses. He says, what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, and I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Jesus tells us that the Old Testament prophet said, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God, heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, I just got a little bit of a revelation on that because, look, for the longest time, I'm like, what does this really mean? The violent take it by force. Does that mean we're supposed to be violent? You got to understand that when it comes to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, the enemy, listen, I don't mean to get too deep into this, the enemy is also trying to take the kingdom of God. And, 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 and listen, there's a, lot of violent, there's a lot of violence that's going on, and the enemy is behind this. He's behind the scenes trying to take the kingdom of God and pull it away from God and pull it away from God's people. And that's a very important part to the message that John came to tell us that Jesus was the one that God was sending. Amen. And that when you and I enter into the kingdom, we're now working for the Lord in the development of his kingdom. But I got to let you know that a lot of the stuff that you and I see on the earth that's taking place on the news, it is not of the Lord. And it's evil men working in the, with the works of the enemy trying 
trying to bring forth their own form of the kingdom of God on earth, and they're doing it by trying to take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And this is a kind of like the big part of what my message is about, this verse right here. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. I want you to know that in this next verse passage of Scripture that we're going to read, it's going to kind of give a little bit more context to what I want to talk to you about this morning with the title of my message, Peace or a Sword. In In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39, it's the chapter before what we just read, Jesus said, I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. So let's go ahead and read that. John 10, 34. Not John. Matthew 10, 34. This is what Jesus says. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Boy, isn't that something? Like, as a matter of fact, in the conversation I was having with that young lady yesterday, she's like, but her interpretation, there's so many places in the Bible where it contradicts. Because she was trying to convince me that the, the church's position, that the tradition of the church usurps the authority of the scripture. That's what the Catholic church teaches. I know you didn't come in here to hear somebody bash on Catholicism. That's not what I planned on doing. I'm just trying to make a point. There's something called a papal bull. What does that mean? The pope writes a letter. And when he writes a letter, it becomes church law. There was a papal bull that was written way back in the 1800s that said, the authority of the church takes precedence over the scriptures. Okay. So Jesus, so, so contradiction of the Bible is not a real thing. The Bible does not contradict itself. Predict 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 itself. And he will rule and reign upon this earth in a new time frame with a new kingdom, and peace will be for all the inhabitants of the earth. But right here he says, you think that I've come to bring peace? No, I've come to bring not peace, but a sword. So what do you mean, Lord? Look what he said. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy worthy of me. Look at this. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So one of the things that I want you to understand is that I love my family. I love my children. But if my children try to start convincing me that Jesus isn't the right way, now instead of peace, we have a sword. If some person that I'll work with is coming against me because of my faith and we cannot get along in this particular area, in that spot of our lives, we don't have peace. Instead, we have a sword. A a division that's taking place, a separation that's taking place between us and those that are out there. I need you to understand that, that there's a whole world of people A Gallup poll every year that says 85% of people call themselves Christians. But I got to tell you that there's no, and I'm not being judgmental, I'm just trying to make a point. There's no way that 85% of Americans are truly servants of the Lord. They're just regurgitating the information. They're saying, oh, that's what mom and daddy were, so, so that's what I am. 
But that's not what a true servant of the Lord is. That's not what a true follower of Christ is. You must be born again, amen? And when you're born again, it brings a separation between who you used to be and who the world is, and it makes you different than them. I hope that this makes sense. And he says, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I want you to know that when you give your heart to the Lord like what we were talking about before, the old man that was born in Adam dies. And a new man is resurrected to newness of life. And that part of that old life and those old ways of thinking and those old things that we used to do start to die. As the Holy Spirit begins to reveal the truth of God's word to our hearts, that old way of life starts to die. The things that we used to do, the things that we used to think were fun, the things, that, the, our old behaviors. Slowly and surely, the Lord, it's like a tourniquet, I think you could say. You know, it, it's something that's not, and this is a weird analogy, but sometimes we get kids that are born that have six fingers. We won't get into that spiritually, but <clears throat> six fingers. And sometimes they'll just tie a stitch around that finger, and they'll just let it die and fall off. And a lot of times, whenever we get, that's how they treat it. If it doesn't have bone in it, they just tie a lot. It's called a ligation, and then it just, I know it's kind of weird, but that's how they do it. They just tie it, and it, fall, it slowly loses its blood flow, and it dies. And whenever we come to Christ, as we yield or surrender to the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to allow those things in our heart and life to begin to die. Those old ways of the world that we used to think we couldn't live without begin to slowly die. So I want to encourage you this morning Amen. Give your heart to Jesus. Keep on serving the Lord, and you will see a change. Now, the beautiful thing is, is this, is that Jesus did come to bring peace. That's not a contradiction. Because the Bible says in the book of Philippians that Paul wrote to the church of Philippi. He said that God, Christ brings a peace that surpasses understanding. So I want you to know that there's peace for the believer today. It's not a contradiction. What he's trying to say is, is that when you decide to give your heart and life to me, that the cross, you will have to bear your cross because when you take a stand to go with me, then guess what? There's going to be a division and a separation between you and the rest of the world around you. But if you will serve me and trust me, that in the midst of your life, there will be a peace that surpasses understanding. It doesn't matter what you're going through, my friend. Oh, it can be bad. You can lose loved ones. You can be in the midst of financial disarray. You can be in the midst of relationship disarray. I was driving home last night at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I stopped. There's a truck right there at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I see these people, and their dog is dead on the side of the road. Dude, I know it used to be like, oh, well, it's just a dog. Now my heart's a little soft. So I got out to see if they needed help. They had just heard a thud. They ran out there. They were picking up their dead dog. I'm just saying, dude, like, I know it's weird if you don't really care about animals, but once you, like, start to learn how to, you know, the animals, you get kind of, it's like it hurts. I know it's just a little animal thing, but I'm just using that as an example. Those people experience some pain right there. I could tell that the, the man didn't really want me around. He was probably, like, didn't want to get emotional, so I took off and I just prayed, Lord, you know, minister to them or whatever. I'm just trying to make a point. Dude, life is full of pain because there's heartache and there's death and there's dying but I got good news for you that no matter what you're facing, it could be a human being that passes away. It could be relationship tragedy. It could be your own child goes the wrong way. Whatever the case, pain. But guess what? The Bible says he brings a peace that surpasses understanding. If you've never experienced that, then it's kind of hard to understand. But I need you to understand. I need you to believe me this morning that Jesus wants to offer a peace. That surpasses understanding. It won't make sense. Your situation might not have changed. The circumstance might still be bad. But Jesus' presence will show up and bring a peace that surpasses understanding. Praise God. So, and whoever, look at this. This is the last verse. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. How, what does that even mean? What would he what are you saying, Lord? Because you see, people, and this is something that I told a group of them, that second girl that asked me, I heard you're a preacher. And in the course of the conversation, I made this comment. I said, I've just learned in life that everybody's looking 
to stick something in the emptiness of their heart. They're looking. They're looking one thing after the other, one thing after the other, sticking it in there, sticking it in there, and most of that stuff is just leaving them more empty, more hurt, 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 hurt. To, to grab a hold of that. Amen? All right. Praise God. So, so Jesus said, I have come not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, I wanted to go back to this verse because I thought this verse is kind of like embodies what I'm really trying to speak to you about this morning. Jesus says, what will I liken this generation to? So this is a comparison. This, he's given us, it's kind of like a parable a, a little bit, a parable or a proverb literature for the Hebrew people, for the Jewish people, they would use this. So he's given us an illustration. What am I going to liken this generation to? Well, it's kind of like we, we, if we were playmates, the playmates, okay? And the playmates would say, hey, listen, we played the flute for you. So, so it's a people that are, that are reaching out to their, to their people that they know and say, look, we played the flute for you, but you wouldn't dance. So we played a joyful song for you on the flute, but you just sat there. Like you're sitting on the porch, boring. Never liked the flute to begin with. If you had had a saxophone, maybe I could have got a little rhythm in my step. So we played the flute for you. In other words, a joyful noise, but you wouldn't dance. And we sang a dirge for you, and you would not mourn. So a dirge, what is that? It's a mournful song like at a funeral when somebody dies. And then Jesus goes on to say this, for John came neither eating nor drinking. And what do they say? They say he has a demon. And the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And he's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And then he says this, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Boy, there's a whole lot right there to unpack. But let me just tell you this. Well, basically what, God, what Jesus is saying, what do I say to this generation that's going to reject the gospel? Because there's a whole world out there that's rejecting the gospel. He's saying that no matter what we did for you, you wouldn't receive it anyway. We try to play a joyful song, you don't want to dance. We try to sing a dirge for you, you don't want to mourn. John the Baptist comes living a life of separation and extremeness in the wilderness and says, repent ye, prepare the way of the Lord. You say he's got a demon. I come sitting down, sharing compassionately with the worst of society, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, and you say, I'm a drunkard and a glutton. Nothing that anybody does is ever going to please you. So what I want you to know as a believer is this. You need to focus in your heart and life on pleasing the Lord. You cannot live your life in such a way that you plan to please the world. No matter what you do, whether you play a joyful no song or whether you sing a dirge, they're not going to be happy with you. It, no matter what you do, if you stand, if you carry a cross down the road and try to preach Jesus to people, they're going to laugh at you and say, hey, Jesus didn't have wheels on his cross. No, if, if you uh, say a somber story to someone, if you sit down and, and you desire to sit with sinners, okay, and, 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 and to share the gospel with them, then, then somebody walks by and they see somebody drinking wine on the table and they're going to accuse you of hanging out with sinful people. I'm not telling you to go hang out with, with people that are doing the wrong thing because sooner or later you probably end up doing what they're doing. But what I'm trying to make a, is a point. The world will always, if you start giving a testimony of Jesus, the world will always judge you. The world will probably never be happy with you. Oh, they were, listen, I can tell you right now, they were kind of excited when that girl asked me yesterday. I heard you were a preacher, and I got to speak a word to them for about five minutes. But there was a girl off in the corner that had I really let it loose. It they, people would have went from smiling to, to frowning real quick. Trust. So, so, yeah, as long as you're telling me what I want to hear, it's all good. 
But as soon as you start crossing lines, my friend, and you start hitting me in the spots that I don't want to be hit in, then it becomes uncomfortable. Then I don't want to, I don't want to dance to your little flute song, and I don't want to sing to your little mournful song. I don't want to hang out with John the Baptist in the wilderness, and I don't want to hang out with you either, Jesus. And not only that, it seems like it's so contradictory that who knows what's right and who's wrong. The Word of God says right here, he was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And look, they say he has a devil. Let's look at this scripture real quick. Luke 5, verse 30. I want you to see that. He said, they said he's a, he's a wine bibber and he's a glutton. Look, this is the religious people. And the Pharisees, that's what you just got to understand. I'm not going to break it down, but they were religious. They were the religious sector. <laughs> you ever seen religious folk before? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you don't have to be dressed up in religious clothing. Like, you could be in a Protestant church. I'm not talking about other kinds of denominations. I'm talking about if you've ever lived for the Lord for any length of time and you experienced a religious person, you know what I'm talking about. I hope we end up with a bunch of religious people in our church that would look down on people for where they are. And, you know, we ain't got time for all that. That's hypocritical. But that's what a religious person will do. You don't look right. You don't dress like you don't smell right. You know, you're not wearing soft clothing. You're not driving the kind of car I would want to see somebody drive. I, you can't speak into my life in your little Hyundai car that doesn't have an air conditioner. Ooh, you know, you can't talk to me. Well, good then. That, 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 that's probably, you know, whatever. Let me just keep going. The Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. See, if you don't even realize you're sick, then you don't need the doctor, <laughs> you know? Now, listen, spiritually speaking, in New Testament faith, that, look, that's okay, too, because you can say, whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. In other words, the doctor might say, I'm sick. My God is a healer. I believe the report of the Lord. Amen? But spiritually speaking... You need to come to the realization that you sick, born of Adam, you sick, and now I need, a, I need the doctor. <laughs> Write me a prescription, Jesus. I already wrote one. I wrote it in my blood. It's called Calvary. It's a hill where my cross was planted and where I hung suspended between heaven and earth. Because I said, just as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so too shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus was lifted up and suspended off of this earth. He died for the sins of mankind. And now when this story is preached, the heart is pricked by the Holy Spirit. And you know what the Holy Spirit is telling you right there? Accept me. Accept me. Accept my work that I did for you on the cross. Receive me. And I will be the physician to you. And I will bring healing to you. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But yet another thing I want you to see, look, they say, oh, the son of man comes eating and drinking. And they say, look at him. He's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus says this, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I want to encourage you in your walk with the Lord, I know, I know I use a lot of words. I do a lot of teaching. I, I really break stuff down. I'm, I'm a different kind of teacher preacher than a lot of people. And I know some of y'all like other preachers that kind of get to the point a little more quickly, I get all that. And, hey, look, as long as they're telling the truth, I love them. Amen. I used to be envious. Like, oh, people like that one better. I don't care about all that no more. All I care about is, are we speaking the same thing? And if you like that other preacher better, praise God. At least you're able to receive. That's what's important. Amen. But what I will tell you is this, is that when I'm breaking it down for you, the reason that I'm doing it is because I want, you to, I want us to be able to understand some things. Because, see, and the more you understand the Bible, the more the Bible comes alive to you. At first, when we read the Bible and we don't understand it, it's kind of like, what, what is even being said? And, and what's the use, right? Have you ever felt that way when you try to read the Bible? What's the use? I don't even understand. I just want to encourage you. First off, the natural mind can't understand the things of God. So receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's step number one. Step number two, call out for more of the Lord. Ask the Lord to give you a hunger and a desire and a love for his word. And praise God whenever you start to study it. And it's a lifelong endeavor, is it not? Christians that have been in the faith for any length of time, you would agree with me on that, right? This is a 
lifelong journey, learning the Word of God, and the more we learn it, the better we understand it. What I need you to know is Proverbs chapter 8 personifies wisdom. What does that mean? Speaks of wisdom as though it's a human being. And specifically, if you break it down, you realize it's talking about Jesus. It's talking about Jesus is wisdom. Wisdom is the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God, the people of God walking and operating on the earth in his understanding according to his word. So wisdom is justified by her deeds. So don't you sit here and judge God whenever he sends John the Baptist into the wilderness dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt, eating locusts and drinking wild honey and saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And at the same time, the same message, the same kingdom of God, Jesus comes and he sits down in the presence of prostitutes and tax collectors. Oh, well, so what you saying, preacher, I can go hang out with prostitutes? Come on, man. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Jesus didn't come to fall into the trap of sin. You're going to, yeah, it's fine. You want to go find a brothel that you're going to walk up in there with a brother or sister in the Lord and you're going to preach Jesus to them? Praise God. Yes. Preach Jesus. Amen. But don't be going hang out with these people and you're going to fall into their trap. Amen. Anyway, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. In other words, Don't call God into question on the way he does things. If there's a servant of the Lord and he looks radical, amen, but at the same time he is, basically I guess what I want to say is that John the Baptist shows us a picture of such separation, right, because he's in the wilderness, he's preaching the gospel, and he's separate from the religious stance of the day. Does that make sense? But And yet Jesus is so compassionate that he says that, it's only the sick people that need a physician. He's not, he's, not so judge, he's not judgmental and looking down. These prostitutes are hurting. These tax collectors are hated by their own people. And he's come to give them the, the message of hope. And so in the midst of this world, we need to understand that, that Jesus is letting us know, you thought I came to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. Because, see, when you come to live for me, it's going to create division. It's going to divide you between your own household. Because at some point in time, your mama might not agree with you, or your brother might not agree with you, or your best friend might not agree with you. When you get saved and the Lord comes to live in your heart and he starts to change you, it will, they may not agree with you at first. But if you just keep living for the Lord and let God produce his fruit in your life and you pray for them, then guess what? They, they will very likely come to the Lord. It might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen in two weeks. It might take a couple of years. But you stay faithful to the Lord. And if the Lord blows a flute, start dancing. And if he sings a dirge, start mourning. Do what the Lord's doing, amen, and not what the world's doing. So here's, I'm getting ready to wrap this thing up. Here's my conclusion. In chapter 10, we learned that, listen, if we're going to serve the Lord, we're likely going to lose something. If you try to hold on to your own life, What is the Lord saying there? Is he saying, oh, let me go out there and take my life? No, 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 no. What he's saying is, is that whatever you thought life was, what did you think life was? I mean, we got too many people for us to go through it in a list, but just a rhetorical question. What did you think life was? You know, a lot of times I'll ask these people at the hospital, what's up, man? How you doing? I'll ask the doctor, what's up, dude? You doing all right? Living the dream, baby. Living the dream. Ain't living no dream. Because five minutes later, they all upset and belly aching and crying. I'm, and I tell them, like, I thought, well, wait, hold on, we live in the dream. Oh, come on, man, it's just what we say, dude. We just say we're living the dream. <laughs> you know, but, so whatever you thought life was when you were 16, 17, 18, through your 20s, through your 30s, however long you've been doing this thing, whatever you thought life was, can I tell you that in God's mind it wasn't what you thought it was? You might still be, you might be a believer showing up in the house of the Lord, and you might think in your heart, Jesus is true life. But yet at the same time, you're trying to hold on to pieces of your old life. No, if you're going to live for the Lord, you're going to lose something. You're going you're to have to let go of that life that you were planning on living, and you're going to have to let that life die. And now in your resurrected life, as you trust the Lord, the message of the cross is going to kill that old stuff and bring resurrection life to new stuff, and he's going to give you a new life. Amen. Serving the Lord means letting go of the world. If you and I are so concerned about what the world thinks about us, with what we drive, with what we wear, 
with how we look, with what we say, and they're just like looking down on us. If we're so worried about that, we're never going to really be able to serve the Lord because we're going to be trying to please the world around us instead of pleasing the Lord. I hope that makes sense. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know everybody's all cool with Jesus till you really, really start talking about him. Y'all know what I'm saying when you really, or, or you really start talking about the word of God for the, for the way that it's written, and then it starts bringing the sword. The division starts. Y'all know what I'm saying. It's true. Wisdom is justified, though. God's going to do things the way he sees to do things. Amen. And he's not going to ask anybody's permission. He's got a plan. His plan was sending his son Jesus. And his plan in your life is allowing Jesus to cause death to the old and to bring life to the new. Amen? The world will never be satisfied with what you do. I want you to know that. Now, listen, this is not a license to sin. The Apostle Paul repeatedly spoke those kinds of things in, in his writings. You know, it's never, but the world is never going to be satisfied with what you do. And, and look, many times you're going to find yourself in a situation where you're going you're gonna to find yourself maybe in a controversy or a situation, and you may respond differently than what you were supposed to. And you'll know it, right? Because once the Lord lives in you and you leave that situation, you're going to know that you didn't do it right. Because you're going to feel it in your heart. Because the conviction of the Holy Spirit is going to show you. But don't let the devil beat you down. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that because you didn't do something right, that you're 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 Jesus out in public, they're going to start watching you with binoculars. And they're going to start waiting for you to mess up. And as soon as you mess up, they're going to be talking about you, okay? I can tell you right now, you watch me close enough, you ain't going to like some of the stuff you see. But I can tell you one thing. I love me some Jesus, and by the grace of God, I want to serve him, and I want to live for him. Amen? This is what, this is what I'm closing with. If you choose singers, musician, y'all can come forward, please. Because I always want to close out with a song of worship, amen, to give glory to our king. And I want you to know that the altars are always open. Even if you just want to come up here and worship, I want to pray with you. Amen. If you need healing this morning, we just need to start trusting God. If you need healing in your physical body, come forward. Let's pray with you. If you need, if you need deliverance in your heart and in your life, come forward. Let's, let's pray for you. If you're going through some things emotionally, whatever you have need of, let's, let's trust God. Amen. And believe that God can move in our heart and our lives. If you just want to come to the front and worship the Lord. I just want you to know that the altars are open, amen, and that we, I want to pray with you, amen. If you choose to serve God, you can't please the world and God, so please God. And look, here's a couple of scriptures that talk about that. The Apostle Paul says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? See, people were already preaching a message in a way that it was going to make people feel better about themselves, changing it up a little bit, but it wasn't a real gospel. And the Apostle Paul says, am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Boy, that's a big thing right there. How many times have we made decisions just so that we could be pleasing to other people? He goes on to say this, but in another letter. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with this gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. So the Apostle Paul saying, I want to please God by speaking the truth of his word. Amen. And then he goes on to say this to the Thessalonians later in that letter. He says, furthermore, we beseech or beg you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk to please God, so you would abound more and more. In other words, we spoke the word of God that in a way that would please God, now you've heard how to live for God. And so now live your life in such a way that it would be pleasing to God. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Praise God. If you have something you need prayer for, please come to the front. Let's give Jesus glory. Amen.